You know, I was surprised by a lot of things when I became a pastor, but one of the things that surprised me the most is how familiar with death I would become. I've really never heard another pastor talk about this publicly. It's not something that uh, I really guessed. I, I never thought about how often I'd get to ride in the front of the hearse when I first became a pastor. And uh, like everybody else in our culture, we, we just have a natural tendency to dance around the topic, but uh, I, I, I can't avoid it, even if I try to. Maybe this hit me the hardest when I first became a senior pastor here at Goshen, and it was three months after I came. My son Jude was born, and it was wonderful, and I remember holding him in the maternity wing of St. Anthony's, which is such a really great place to hang out at, because you get to hear the cries of newborns just loudly announcing that there's new life. And uh, while I was sitting there, hold, holding him with one hand, my, um, and, and hearing the very first breaths of kids all over just entering the world, I had a Jude in one arm, and on the other hand, my, my phone rings. And um, I, I got the call from, I think it was Marty Vanderheide. And, and there I am talking about the really sad fact that his father, Fred, a godly saint, had just breathed his last breath on this earth and entered eternity. And I'll just never forget sitting there with both hands full <laughs> talking about how quickly life goes. And it's always strange, but it's, it's not an uncommon conversation for me to have. I've had the solemn honor to be in the room with families when doctors come in and give really bad news. And I, I've looked at the faces of suffering people about to face eternity. I am, I'm not complaining, this is a really important part of what I do, but I am, I'm often the first call that people make after the ambulance leaves the house. And I've had way more conversations than I wish I had with folks just hearing Awful news. Like, I'll never forget when Eddie and Betsy asked to have a meeting in the council room, and I had no idea what they were going to talk about. And uh, Eddie talked about his cancer diagnosis. Or last, last Saturday, I mean, it ended out great, but one of her moms stopped by uh, on her way home uh, where she was about to tell her family this really, really awful diagnosis and uh, talks to me and, and Dr. Juan. And You'd kind of think I'd be ready for this. <laughs> like, I, I sort of over-prepare for a lot of things, but I, I'm not. I, I'm never ready, and I don't have a default script, I say. Like, I, I should probably memorize something and say something in the mirror, but I, I don't, and I haven't. I normally just sit there sort of in shock. And uh, it, it's, it's possible that there was a class in seminary that uh, they taught the magic words that made suffering make sense, but I, I did not pay attention that day, I guess. <laughs> but... Uh, and here's the other thing. Most of the time when you deal with suffering and challenges and promises or challenges, you, you know what to say. Like, I'll give you an example. My poor son Jude is having what he thinks is a painful medical crisis. Jude is having trouble sleeping. He has a life-interrupting condition right now. His mouth feels like he's on fire. He can't really eat solid food a lot of the time. Uh, his exact medical condition is that his adult teeth are coming in, right? So he's got adult teeth pushing through. He's, like, he's pulling his teeth. And all of you are smiling at this. You know why you can smile at this? Because you've all been there and you've all lived through this. And when Jude comes to me in pain, I can look at him with a straight face and go, Jude, you're going to be fine. <laughs> like, this is short. This is temporary. We've all gone through what you're going through. In fact, we sort of forgot about it. <laughs> like, a lot of challenges people have, you, you know, we all went through it. It's okay. But this one, death, cancer, terminal suffering, no one I've met can say, it's going to be okay. I've lived through it. You're going to be fine. Like, like, no one can do that, right? And part of our faith is saying what God says, that, look, compared to eternity, like, here's what the Bible says. This life is like a breath or short-lived seasonal grass, or, you know, the Bible says that this life is like a dream that you just wake up from into a longer, more realistic eternity. These are all things the Bible says, but the fact is we still have to work a bit to thinking about heaven and turning our eyes upon Jesus, because when we don't, you know this song, right? 
The things of earth seem permanent. Now, we have been steadily, by, paragraph by paragraph, looking at some fascinating stories from the early church. And the church started, it was born and raised during a crisis. Today, though, we, man, I'm excited about today's passage. We experience something extraordinary. Because we, in today's episode, look at the, well, on one hand, the sad, tragic story about death and suffering and injustice, but at the same time, we get to hear the last words of someone who God gives an amazing gift to, and he shares with all of us. The person in our story today gets to see what none of us have seen. He gets to see what believers see when they face death. It's a topic that most of us manage to avoid, but one day we won't be able to avoid this. And wouldn't you like to be able to know what you see when you close your eyes for the last time? I would. <laughs> like, and if, if you know for sure what happens next, it might change what you do now. And God, I mean, this is just amazing. God gives us a vignette of what's on the other side in a way that I'm convinced give people like us exactly what we need to face today and tomorrow with courage and resolve. In fact, I'm convinced that if you know what Stephen saw, you'll be able to do the right thing, even if it's hard, even if there's consequences. Hearing what Stephen saw is empowering. You know, let's just drop right into the story with a little introduction. We're in the book of Acts chapter 7, and here's how the story goes. Verse 54. Now, when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, okay, I guess I I should tell you what they just heard. So if you heard last week, you know that Stephen is on trial for basically talking an awful lot about Jesus. And he's talking, here's the problem. He's talking about Jesus in a city where it was all built, the commerce, the economy, people's jobs was built around one idea. And the idea was that God only met with people in the temple. That's why people came to Jerusalem. That's why people had jobs in Jerusalem. So talking badly about the temple had the potential to destroy the tourism industry. It had uh, the potential to destroy the whole city. So believe it or not, talking against the temple, as silly as it seems, was the only capital offense that the Jewish leaders could prosecute. And on top of that, a good number of the people who really, really cared about the temple In Jerusalem, you see words like the Sanhedrin or Sadducees. One of the things they believed is that, well, they loved the temple, but they did not believe in the afterlife. So the temple is really important, but there's no heaven, there's no hell, there's no afterlife, there's no resurrection. The here and the now, the Jerusalem temple was the only thing that really mattered on the whole planet. And Stephen was a Christian. Uh, And he was accused of minimizing the temple because he did what Christians do. He made a big deal about about Jesus. He said, God is way bigger than you think he is. He doesn't live in like some tiny cramped room. God does what he wants. He doesn't always make sense, but we should trust him, Stephen would say. God is really big. Eternity is a long time. And right now matters because how you use your time matters uh, because it may affect eternity. And the thing that Stephen said, it wasn't just Christian theology, it was rebellion. It was offensive because it undercut everything that the city of Jerusalem stood for, which might be the best way I can explain what we read next, which is that when they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. It sounds bad. To be clear, I'm not a lawyer. I could not practice first century law, but my my sense is that if you're on trial for something with an immediate death penalty on the line and you watch the judge, jury, audience, and executioner just starting to lose their minds, uh, it's probably a clue that the case isn't going very good for you. (laughs) And and for Stephen, like, he's gone. Like, he's just got a death sentence. And there's a bit of a, you know, the academics debate whether this execution is legal in Jewish law or is this a unruly mob. Like, it doesn't really matter to Stephen because he's, he's about to die at this point. But all that, what matters to Stephen is what God gives him. God gives Stephen an amazing gift because Stephen gets to see something. And I, I'm convinced you and I will one day see. 
what Christians get to see is God giving, and this is amazing, God in this verse gives Christians a view through the eyes of Stephen what it looks like when death wakes us up from this dream we call life. This is verse 55. So Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, so this is God involved, he looks up to heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So, 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 so he says, look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Uh, now, uh, remember why like, these people are so mad, right? The mob believes that God's glory is where? It's in the temple, right? God's, God's not up there. He's in the, the, the temple. And, and Stephen says, nope, I actually see it. God, look, God's in heaven. Jesus is Lord. And, and by the way, uh, the mob also believe that this life is all that you get. So Stephen, who believes in eternity awaits, and eternity counts, like this is like not helping him at all. The, the mob believes that uh, Jesus is gone. And, and Stephen sees Jesus as king, um, because Stephen sees what's true, the gospel that we still teach today. And in this moment, God gives an incredible gift to, to Stephen. His faith is made sight, as the old hymn says. He, in that moment, sees heaven and Jesus and God's glory. And in a very real sense, he sees what we all believe, but none of us have experienced yet. Like if you're a Christian, you believe that heaven awaits you and that this life is short and eternity is long and that God is sitting on the throne even if this is why faith is hard sometimes. God is in control even if you're in the middle of a mob that's about to kill you. And of course, saying these things didn't do anything to calm down the mob. It made them more angry. So the next verse says, At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragging him out of the city and began to stone him. And uh, don't get too fixated on the details. They're just, they're just awful. He's, he's dying a horrible painful, gory death. There is this one line I should point out here. Uh, Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at a young man named Saul. It's not supposed to be a funny story, but in the middle of this, there's a funny, I guess, knowing wink. Because Saul, you may know this guy in charge of the coats. You may know him as St. Paul. He's in the mob, (laughs) and he's there protesting. He's going, look, God isn't in control. God isn't on the control. There's no heaven. Jesus definitely doesn't appear to people. And sort of the punchline is, I mean, if you know the story, Jesus actually appears to, of all people, this guy. And God turns Saul's life around in ways that we'll talk about later. But I didn't want you to miss this sort of knowing wink in this tragic story that points out that God is big enough to turn around chaos for his glory. Just a wink, though. Back to Stephen. And look, um, You know, if I were Stephen, right, knowing about heaven, going, oh, Jesus is on the throne, it must mean, man, I'm so glad you're in control. Could you, like, I don't know, turn the rocks into feathers or something, right? Could you, you like me, I like you, could you take care of my suffering? But it doesn't always work like that for people God loves. The next line goes, while they were stoning him. This is bad. Stephen prays, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. For Stephen, this is sort of amazing. Seeing eternity, the first thing he did, well, the first thing it changed is it changed how he lived his life and how he thought about other people, which we'll talk about. I want to point out this line. When he said this, he fell asleep. And I, I just want to point out this thing that, that we tend to rush over, and it's how the Bible talks about death. You see the line here, he fell asleep. Now, when most people see this or read this or think this, a lot of people would label this as a euphemism. Does everyone know what a euphemism is? You do, right? It is, I think the dictionary says it is a more polite expression used as a substitute for words or phrases that might otherwise be considered 
harsh or unpleasant. It's a nice thing that might not be true <laughs> that is nicer to say than a bad thing. I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I guess I'll say this anyway. Before we had wild kids, <laughs> we had a wild dog. Uh, I, I got it before we were married, and I, I liked the dog. He was half Jack Russell Terror and a half Chihuahua, and I adopted him from a shelter. He had been abused, uh, but, but he was it just really damaged, I think. Uh, but I tried to make it work, and we lived on Long Island, and I, I love this little dog, but uh, oh, I don't say the dog loved me, but sort of hated everybody else. And that was fine. I had mixed feelings about everybody else, too, but uh, the dog didn't like Colette. And whenever I'd try and hug Colette, uh, Mikey would try and bite the toddler. And we gave the dog a bunch of chances. But really, sadly, like it just sort of broke our heart. But we, we, we took the dog back to the shelter. And you know what they tell you at the shelter? Here's what they told me. We're going to take Mikey upstate to a nice little farm where he'll run around. And uh, I had really never gone north of Long Island, never been in the Hudson Valley, and uh, never been at any farms upstate, so I thought I was safe. So when we first moved here, I would always get a little nervous every time we drove by a nice little farm, because uh, I thought maybe Mike would find me, but, but finally I was like, you know, I think we're safe, he, he can't find us. But the more I thought about it, I, um, I think we'll send him to a nice farm upstate, I discovered they don't actually send dogs to farms upstate. It's a euphemism, right? It's not the truth, but it's nicer than reality. You say something nice because you don't want you know, people to feel terrible about things. Uh, and a lot of us look at this line here. A lot of people look at, he fell asleep. It sounds like a euphemism. It's just a nice way of saying, Stephen died horribly. But here's the thing. In the Bible, this is not a euphemism. When the Bible says they fell asleep, it's not trying to avoid harsh truth. It's telling a different truth. I'll give you an example. The, well, this is the second time. The first time in the New Testament where someone says he fell asleep when someone else would say he died, Jesus is talking about his friend who died. Uh, his friend heart stops, his body's decomposing, and Jesus says something, don't worry Lazarus has only fallen asleep, and none of the disciples go, what a nice poetic way of talking about the recently past, <laughs> right? No one says that. If you read it, the disciples go, so, so Jesus, uh, why are we in a rush? He's just gonna, you know, he must be napping. Either he's not dead, or Jesus, you're wrong. It's not a euphemism. But if you know the story of Lazarus and Jesus, you don't know exactly why Jesus said he's fallen asleep, because Lazarus was really dead, but it wasn't the end. He actually wakes up, you know the story, and when he wakes up, when he opens his eyes again, there's Jesus, he's with Christ. You know, the word death has a sense of finality, but there is nothing final about death. Because for the Christian, you, you open your eyes again and you're with Jesus, which isn't even the headline of this story, right? That you're still alive with Jesus. The surprise for Stephen, or the headline, was that he sees Jesus on the throne at the right hand of the Father, which only means one thing. It means that for all those times when you start to lose hope, or wonder how things can possibly turn out okay, or when you see what looks like reality and wonder if justice will ever show up, or if loss will ever be replaced by love, or you know, really specifically, if you're Stephen and you're getting murdered for doing the right thing, Jesus on the throne in eternity means that justice is possible. If eternity is long and life is short, then justice and goodness and love is attainable. And that is what I believe God wants all of us to know about death and dying and suffering. And in this remarkable story, you all get to see what Stephen gets to see. And I, I don't really love talking about death. It's a topic we all want to avoid. But the fact is you can only avoid it for so long. They, they say the human mortality rate is still hovering around 100%, right? It's worth thinking about someday or sometime it is, you know, this is what you experience if you're in Christ. Death is just the beginning. And, you know, by the way, you may wonder, what do I tell people when they're face-to-face -face with death? 
Um, I mean, I, I weep with those who weep. And just, I, I had to think about what I actually do because I don't, I don't really sit there silently and I don't have anything, well, I don't have anything different to say. It's not like if, if you're part of a church, you get brand new information as soon as you realize that death may be imminent. Um, in fact, it, what, what often happens is a person on the other side of the table says something like, this is awful, this is awful, comma, but I know, or I believe, or I'll say something like, and we talk about this a lot, because the thing you really need to know when you're face-to-face with death isn't novel, it's not unique, it's, it's something we talk about every single week. To God be the glory, right? What does that mean? It means that God is bigger than you can imagine. He's bigger than this short life. We sort of had a, a theme of the music this week, but all of our songs, right, have the idea behind it that life is short, God is really big and eternal and trustworthy. Every call to obey God from Scripture carries behind it God's kindness, both now and for forever. And everything we say, when we say to trust God, it carries behind it this idea that God is trustworthy, not just right now, but forever. You know, the fact is, Stephen didn't learn anything new when he saw Jesus and the heavens opened. Like, he didn't learn anything, right? All he did is he saw what he always believed. He got to see what, well, that what he trusted was the case was the case. That the reality that God is on the throne, it was not new information to him. He just got to see confirmation of what he believed by faith all along. Eternity, folks, is real. But, you know, I, I do want to add, just, because, just, just in case you think that the episode in our story this week is only good for a funeral or a hospital visit or something. And I know most of us try not to ever think about death, so this may not really help you a whole lot. But let me make this argument. Sometimes you're in a worse place because you don't think about forever. I want to share with you some insight I learned from Paul David Tripp. He has this like crazy theory about Christians and problems and eternity. And what he says, part of our problem is we avoid thinking about heaven or hell or death or suffering. I mean, nobody wants to think about that. But what he says is if you were different, if you started thinking about eternity, it would help you. Here's what he says. It's an oversimplification. But I believe, he says, the following statement is true. If Christians lived as if eternity was real, Many of our problems, he says, would disappear. This is a really bold, provocative claim to make, right? Because each, work, each week at church, we sing, we talk about, we in different ways affirm that we believe in heaven and hell and eternity. But one of our problems, he says, is that we forget about it when we go home, unless we're at a funeral or something. In fact, let me just ask honestly, how many of you thought about eternity in the last week? Or think about it, how did heaven impact your decisions? If I had to answer a question, I'd, I'd be really honest and say, I just, I didn't think about it at all <laughs> this week, right? And I don't think it impacted my life very much at all. But what Tripp says is because we don't think about heaven, it actually makes our life really complicated. In fact, he says, and I'll explain this in a minute, he says a lot of our everyday struggles are about the fact that we forget about eternity. In fact, he says our problems are more based in our forgetfulness about heaven than the messiness our world is in. And you'll be asking, I was, how on earth does thinking about heaven help us? He has a bunch of examples. And uh, I'll be honest, I am guilty of almost all these things, but I, I want to share them with you. But the fact is when you forget about eternity or when you only think about life and death when you're at a grave site, He's convinced that thinking about eternity, if you think about what Stephen saw, it could change your life in really amazing ways. Here's what he says. First of all, he says, when you forget about eternity, we focus too much on ourselves and the here and now. And here's what the Bible says. You know this. God made you and I to live with more in view than just the here and now. We're designed to live more for more than just our comfort and happiness in this moment. In fact, the Bible teaches that we're not in charge. 
we don't rule the universe. And part of the Bible is that life moves by the will and purpose of well, another to, to who gets the glory. And the problem psychologically is when you forget about eternity, you shrink all of your life, your identity down to your momentary wants and needs. And we, we may unintentionally just fight against God's sovereign narrative. And we, we fight against how God intends us to find joy. Like here's how it looks like, you know, number two, when we forget about eternity, when you forget about how joyful heaven is, you start asking and demanding too much of people. Like if, if this is paradise, we, we unwittingly, without really thinking about it, expect and ask the people around us to help provide our paradise, which is really unfair to everybody around us. People around you, they, they can't. You know, weddings are great. You don't want to tell newlyweds this, but people can't give you all the joy and things that you are designed to enjoy in eternity. So you expect too much, you ask too much of people, and that messes us up. In fact, he says, when you forget about eternity, it changes you to be controlling and afraid. Like when you, if you think that this is all you got, if you think that life is passing you by, it just, it messes your head up. And that may look like unfulfilled dreams. And, uh, you know, here's what eternity gives you. Instead of, it gives you the freedom to instead of designing your own heaven on earth and getting frustrated when things don't work, eternity allows you to let your frustrations become reminders of what heaven will be like. Imagine how different your life would be if everything that frustrated you, every disappointment, everything that seemed messed up could be a gentle but still painful reminder of where God is most kind, which is heaven. When we forget about heaven, number four, this is huge. We question God's goodness. It's a massive problem. If you forget about God's eternal narrative, we almost can't help but doubt God's character. I mean, this is the difficult question to answer, right? We believe God is good and kind and just and generous and then I mean, the reality is God's promises only meet their fullest fulfillment in the world that is to come. And when you don't think about that, it looks like, well, it looks like we've been hit by divine bait and switch because you watch the news, you talk to people and life on this earth is just, well, it's hard to reconcile with a good God. It's hard to reconcile this life with God's power if you forget about eternity. When you forget about this eternity, this happens. We become more disappointed than thankful. And we're disappointed and ungrateful, not because God's failed us or because we've suffered too much, uh, not even because the people around us have been particularly challenging to live with. But when you forget about eternity, you, you forget. We approach life counting on our short life to give us things, joys, uh, passions, realities. We, we expect this life to give us all the things that we're designed for in heaven. So we become disappointed. And in fact, sometimes if you really forget about it, you, you don't even notice all the good things God gives you. Number six, when we forget about eternity, we lack motivation and hope. When life inevitably disappoints you. You almost can't help it, but lose enthusiasm or optimism. That's one way. Or if you remember eternity, you remember that, or you know, what Stephen saw, that life is steadily marching toward heaven and eternity. You know what eternity can do for you? Eternity fills you with a reason to get up in the morning. And actually, like, like knowing about forever actually makes this short life fuller. Do you want to live life to its fullest today as you wait for paradise? I mean, the very best way to make your life now count, to live on purpose, to, to make the best of every moment, is to know that your life was never designed to be heaven on earth. 
Your life, your time, talents, and resources, everything you think about, everything you do, it's all preparation for your final destination. And in this moment, Stephen gets to see what that is, and he lets us know what it is. You all need to know this, that you are not living in the final chapter of your story. One day, everything will be made new, you sang. One day, things that are bent will be straightened. Everything that is decayed and broken will be restored to new. Eternity. Like, thinking about that right now gives you a reason, a drive to be thankful right now. In fact, thinking about God, like, like what, this is, this is what's, what the world actually looks like right now. God is still on the throne, can give you joy, even when things don't seem to be working right now. Eternity makes your life different and profoundly better. So Father in heaven, Holy Spirit, Son, can you, in our darkest times, remind us of eternity and heaven? For those of us who mourn, for those of us going through the valley of the shadow of death, remind us that we, we can fear no evil, for you are with us. For those of us who are going through really good times and life is exciting and new and full of opportunities, remind us that as good as things are, as thankful as we might be, there's more to life than right now. And Father, as we think about eternity, as we not forget forever, can you help us to trust you, to live for something bigger than ourselves, may we not be satisfied by short-lived pleasures, but may we live for something bigger than us, the biggest, most grand thing of all, you and your glory for eternity. God, please convict us of the times when our minds are too small, our ambitions are too weak, and our lights are too dim. May the prospect of our future embolden us today. I ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen.